Okay, boomer. Okay, boomer. Do you want to be young again? Would you want to be young again? Does any of you want to be young again? Are you serious? Who would want to be young in today's world? Who would want to be young with today's sexuality, today's climate change, today's pandemic, today's recessions and depressions, today's lopsided income inequality, today's new emergent viruses and diseases? Who would want to be young again in such an age? Many of us are grateful that we are on our way to check out at the heavenly reception. There's an old French saying, if youth only knew, if age only could. Well, I know, and I still can, believe it or not, but I no longer want to. I no longer want to, because this world had become dystopian. I pity the young. My heart goes out to them. They are faced with an ever-darkening storm, totally unequipped to row their way out of that sea, that particular tsunami that is about to devour them. They are unskilled in the arts of life. They have a lot of information, but no knowledge. Some of them have knowledge, but not wisdom. And some of them have wisdom, but no listeners and followers. It's a doomed, doomed scenario. It's an apocalypse. And columns of youth are marching straight into it, like so many lemmings on so many cliffs in so many continents. Who would want to be young in such a world? Yes, yes, I know. Okay, boomer. Every generation, this is the next generation. Every old man says how good it was, how good it had been in his youth, and how horrible the youth of today is. It's a common complaint, replete throughout history, one generation after another. One generation after another disparaged, chastised, criticized, and castigated the next generation. And I'm no exception, of course. But this time, this time is different. This time is different because the young of today lack basics. And these basics were present throughout human history. There hasn't been a single generation until 30 years ago. There hasn't been a single generation who was so devoid of these foundational cornerstones of what it is and what it means to be human. The generation born, generations born after 1990, they lack these cornerstones. They don't have these foundations. They are adrift at sea because they are unmoored. They're not grounded in any past, in any future, and most recently, in any present. Judging by any criterion, by any definition of what it is to be a human being, a person, even a personality or a self, the young don't have any of these. Now, generations come and generations go, things change, and in the long run, they often change for the better. But what happens when we have two or three generations from 1990 onwards who don't have, who don't possess the basic toolkit. Generations with no conveyor belt. Generations who can't carry the torch in this torch relay known as history, human history. You see, all previous generations shared many things in common. The criticism of the old was based on the fact that the young shared something with the old. There was a common understanding, a social compact, a set of values around which everyone coalesced, old and young. And what the young had done, they had transformed these values, they had modified them, they had applied them differently. And so this 
this irritated and this angered old people. But the common compact, the agreement that was known at the time as community or society or family, the institutions, they were always there. There was an unspoken transfer of uh, concordance, of accord. There was a shared goal, the survival of the species and its propagation and its progress and its advance. This is precisely what is missing since 1990 onwards. I am a very well-read person, some of you may have noticed. I have read all the diatribes, all the analyses, all the black prophecies, all the lamentations, all the apocalyptic writings of old people, old people like me. I have read them all. And they were dead wrong. All of them were dead wrong. They were dead wrong because the youth of their day was just a variation on the older generations. The youth diverged from the older generations, but usually incrementally. Or if not incrementally, it revolutionized things. It made them better. It was, these were fighter generations. Starting in the 20th century, something really, really bad, some malignant, malign process started to occur within the social fabric, within the minds of people. There was a tumor spreading in the kingdom. The apple was rotting from both, both ends, the old and the young. And there, has been, there had been no recovery. There has been no recovery since then. And today the young are more afflicted than any other age group. When I say the young, I mean between 11 or 12 and uh, 35. That means adolescents, emergent adult, adults, and young adults. There's something wrong with these age groups. Something substantially, profoundly, and fundamentally wrong with these, with these people. Why? Because they miss critical blocks, critical, critical Lego blocks, critical components, critical constituents, of what used to be, for 10,000 years, the common consensus on being human. In many respects, the young would not have qualified as human in the rest of human history. The world today is homogenized and it is hegemonized. There are no exceptions. There are no enclaves. There are no reserves. There are no reservoirs of change. Mass media, social media, Hollywood, cultural exchanges, travel, international travel, international transport, all these have brought us, back, brought us all together in good ways and in some horrible ways. The seeds of affliction, decadence and corruption spread as fast as any virus and any product. And they did. And they had infected all of us. I'll come to it at the end. So we are living in a one world. There's no one world government, but there's a one world. Absolutely. Ruled by well-situated, strategically situated elites. And so the young have nowhere to turn to for an alternative model. They, they have nowhere to ten, turn to for an option. This is the source of a popularity of so many gurus and, and public, public intellectuals and self-styled experts and so on. Because the young are befuddled. They're disoriented. They're looking for a father. They're looking for someone to tell them what to do, to restore a sense of locus, a sense of control, a sense of belonging, a sense of acceptance. They are, they are utterly dislocated, depersonalized, derealized. Many of them are amnesiac. They medicate themselves, self-medicate with sex, with drugs, with alcohol.
Numerous, numerous generations have done the same. Each young generation overdrank. Each young generation was disruptive, luckily for us. Each young generation revolutionized things, transformed, transmogrified, transmuted, and transubstantiated the old ways of doing things. Where would we have been without the young? These generations from 1990 are not the same. They are not the same. They are not transformational generations. They are not they are not the same like previous young generations because they don't share the overwhelming vast majority of the elements that make humans human. This is a serious accusation. But those of you who had bothered to listen to my previous videos about youth sexlessness, about promiscuous sex, about hookups, about um, the young youth culture today. Those of you who bother to listen to these videos know that every word I say is based on studies and research, dozens of studies in dozens of countries throughout decades. I never say anything which is not well-founded, well-grounded, in the latest cutting-edge, bleeding-edge knowledge that we possess. And so, my previous video dealt with hookups. The young have only casual, drunk sex with strangers. This had become the only sexual option. 81% of the young engage in casual, drunk sex with total strangers. And this is their only sexual practice. They rarely have relational sex. And when they do have relationships, these relationships turn out to be sexless in most of the cases. There's a disconnect between sex, relations, emotions, and intimacy. This is not human. Our brains are designed to connect sex with intimacy, with emotions. That's the way they are designed. This is not, what I'm saying right now is not a moral judgment. I'm an, I'm an agnostic. I don't believe in the infantile projection that is called God. I'm not a religious person. I'm not hectoring. I'm not preaching. I'm not moralizing. I'm a scientist. I'm describing facts. Our brains are built to connect sex with emotions and intimacy. End of story. It's a fact, biological fact. Our bodies react the same. When we break this, we act against nature, against our own nature. This has vast, vast psychological and biological, physiological, medical implications. For example, engaging only in casual drunk sex with strangers induces depression and anxiety, lifelong depression and anxiety. Another fact, because object objectifying yourself as a habit has very negative psychological and psychosocial consequences. Also a fact. Watch my video on hookups. So, in the past, one night stands, casual sex, promiscuous sex, um, drunk sex, hookups, they were all available since the 1960s. There's nothing new about them, but they were on the menu. They were options among many other options. You could choose to have a one night stand, but you could also choose to have sex within a relationship. You could choose to have drunk sex, but you could also choose to have sober sex. The facts are incontrovertible, and I'm, I refer you to mostly to studies by Lisa Wade and others. The facts are incontrovertible. The young today engage almost exclusively in drunk, non-relational, casual sex with total strangers. That's a fact. 
the young, lack even the most rudimentary and basic skills for intimacy, for relationships, for family, even a transactional family, business-based family. They are incapable of forming long-term attachments and bonds with others. Insecure attachment is the most prevalent form of attachment. Flat attachment is the second. This has never happened before. There has never been a generation of young people who didn't know how to do intimacy, who were incapable of forming relationships which lasted more than a few months. There has never been a generation of young people who didn't ultimately want to have a family to get married. Marriage was the institution of that time. You don't have to get married today. You can cohabit. But all of them wanted to form dyads, couples. So this is the first time in human history that people prefer to remain single, totally atomized, not in touch with each other. There's a first, first young generation who elevated the art of avoidance and withdrawal into an ideology, a religion. The young of today seek to remain alone and they perceive any incursion, any attempt to connect, any attempt to have relationship and intimacy, they perceive these as threats or worse still, a breach of etiquette politically incorrect. The young of today want to live all by themselves in a solipsistic universe with their cats and dogs, if they're lucky, or goldfish, or always Netflix. And video games, of course. How could I forget video games? Four to five hours a day. The young of today had, have chosen atomization. They construct their living arrangements this way. Either they live with their parents, which separates them from peers. One third of them live with parents. Or they go away, leave the parental nest, and try their best, do their best, to remain single for as long as possible. Starting in the year 2016, and to this very day, a majority of men and women had never, had not dated in the preceding year. A majority of men and women had not met another man or woman in the previous year, starting in 2016. Dating is down 51%. It went down 51% between 2008 and 2018. Hookups soared because hookups allow the young of today to remain atomized, separated, solipsistic, not attached. And so hookups had soared. The number of sexual partners had skyrocketed to the point that women today have almost as many sexual part casual sexual partners as men. Now, nothing wrong with casual sexual partners. If it is one item on the menu, if it leads ultimately to relationships, nothing wrong. It's a path to self-discovery, sexual self-discovery. It's a form of agency. I'm not against any form of sex. Sex is the most beautiful thing in the world. But the young of today had transformed sex into by far the most ugly thing in the world. When they have sex, in the majority of cases, they are extremely drunk. They're extremely drunk. They don't know what they're doing. They don't experience even the sex. When they have sex, they have it with people whom, whom they, will, who will, they will never see again. In, in one-fifth of the cases, they don't know their names. The sex is totally anonymous. Pickups, bars, pubs, clubs. It's like sex had become an instrument to destroy intimacy, to undermine relationships, to prevent attachment and bonding. Drunk out of their minds, 
these young men and women throw their bodies away like so much tissue paper, like throw away garbage or trash. They self-trash. But they don't see this as self-trashing. They see this as normative behavior. Everyone is doing, the, doing it. What's wrong with that? They don't understand. What's wrong with that is constant objectification of your body ruins your mind. Constant drinking. 44% of college students binge drink once a week to the point of blackouts and loss of consciousness. That's not some vaccine. That's semen. S-E-A-M-A-N. Look up his studies. The data in my videos is hard data. I know it's unbelievable. I know the things I'm saying are unthinkable, even to me. Every time I make such a video, I, I'm traumatized. I can't sleep at night. I can't function for days after that. Because I can't believe what I'm reading. I can't believe adolescents having group sex with older adults. I can't believe, total strangers. I can't believe young men and women throwing themselves totally drunk at the mercy of total strangers, assuming enormous risks, acting recklessly. Unprotected sex is very common. I don't believe the extent the type, the character of the sex in these casual encounters, how, how they confuse and conflate intim, intimate sex acts with a total lack of intimacy. Sometimes they don't even know, remember the name of the, of the partner. The, it's, a, it's total mayhem. And I'm mentioning sex because sex is the pathway and the encapsulation of intimacy, relationships and family has been in all previous generations, old and young. Every old generation, had criticized the sexual practices of the young. Every, starting with uh, ancient Greece. Every old generation carped, moaned, bitched, complained, quetched, you name it. And I am no exception. I'm just an old man venting. But there was no young generation, and that happens to be a historical fact. There was no young generation, not one, throughout human history, not one young generation, not even in Nazi Germany, not even in communist, in the communist USSR. There has never been a young generation, not even in, in imperial Rome, Rome, not in ancient Egypt, not in the most cruel dynasties and circumstances. There's never been a young generation who had given up on human connection, on humanity, on intimacy, on love, on relationships, on family, on children, on having a future. There hasn't been a single young generation who had en masse, collectively, given up on life, rejected life, chosen to have lives unlived, abrogated, and denigrated and erased the meaning of life. The young today have, they lead, they lead meaningless lives. They have meaningless sex with meaningless people whom they just met. They drink themselves into oblivion and meaninglessness. They dread meaning. They, they are in this sense existentialists, if you wish. They dread meaning. And they dread anything that brings meaning into their lives. A career path, a future, a plan, sex, love, intimacy, relationships, children, the future. They don't want a future. They are living in the present because when you live in the present, your actions have no consequences. And they don't want the consequences. Above all, they don't want to make sense of their lives and of the world. Why? This massive rejection of life. Rejection of life is a phrase coined by Harvey Kleckley in 1942. He saw it coming. Why this life unlived? Life unlived is a phrase coined by Jeffrey Seinfeld in 1991. 
he was already witnessing it happening. Why this? Why this giving up on life, on reality? Maybe because reality had become unbearable. But you know, previous generations went through minor, minor events like the Holocaust, and the Great Depression, and World War II. What in this generation had rendered them so spineless, so weak, so lacking in resilience and inner strength? What led them to this? And why had they given up on us? Why did they float away in this island of fantasy? Because all of them live, have, lead very rich fantasy lives. Substitute for reality, unbearable and intolerable as it is. What led them to do this? How, how, how did we lose our children? What had we done to lose our children? I blame my generation, of course. I blame my generation, next generations. I blame everyone over the age of 40. We had let them down. We had shown them a world without mercy, without love, without compassion, without care, without meaning, and above all, without a future. We took away from them these gifts, which would have motivated them to be much more fully human. And they gave up. They simply gave up. Because we gave them no good, no good reason to go on and to fight. And the reasons that we did give them, they were dead reasons. Material reasons. Money. iPhones. They used iPhones to hook up with strangers to have drunk sex with. They used their cars to drive recklessly into a tree and to die. They used every gift we gave, gave, we gave them to commit suicide with psychological suicide or physical suicide. They want to die. They don't want to be here anymore. They're killing themselves in a million, in a myriad ways. In myriad ways, the young are killing themselves. Suicide rates among young women had climbed 54% in one decade. Depression rates up five times, anxiety rates up three times in one decade. They are torn and ruined and devastated and obliterated by us. And they don't want to be here anymore. They want, they want to escape. They want to flee this dystopia that we had constructed for them and for their descendants, which they don't have. Because to have children is a vote of trust. It's to vote trust in the future. And they don't have trust in anyone or anything. And they know they don't have a future. It is part of a stalled revolution. It's a stalled revolution. Women had become more masculine and more narcissistic and even more psychopathic. These are facts, by the way. These are facts based on studies. I refer you to my previous video on hookups. Women had become, women and men today describe themselves in identical terms using masculine words. We have a test, a series of tests for this. So women had become totally masculine. Now the rate of women in narcissism, I mean, weight of narcissistic women is identical to the rate of narcissistic men. Only 30 years ago, 75% of, of narcissists were, were men, today 50-50, possibly 60-40 in favor of women. women. Women are becoming psychopathic. They're using coarse language and coarse and foul language. They're drinking more heavily than men when compared to body mass and the fact that they lack enzymes to process alcohol. They commit adultery almost at the same rate. They engage in casual sex. The number of partners, sexual partners of women, now equals the number of sexual partners of men. M women are emulating psychopathic men, simply. And they define themselves as another type, type of male, male with a vagina. Different set of genitalia, but otherwise, totally male. Men are reacting very badly to this. All my videos are based on hard data. This abrogation, negation, vitiation, and discard 
of gender roles is an attempt to flee and to escape reality. It's an attempt to control reality by becoming what you're not. When a woman claims to be a man, and this is what the majority of them do in tests that we administer, when women claim to be men, they're trying to control an environment which they perceive as ominous and threatening. It's a, a desperate attempt to somehow regain agency, to restore a balance of power, to inject consensus, to inject consent into processes which hitherto uh, were not consensual, largely. And of course, it's an attempt to redistribute uh, wealth and redistribute political and business power and educational power. So there's a war on between the genders. And this war is founded on what I said earlier. The rejection of life, the rejection of meaning, the fear of intimacy and of the future. Because when women become men, they are, they, when they had become men, they had eliminated the last remaining vestige of reality. It's not real. Women are not men. They're definitely not psychopathic men. But when they act as such, they had taken away yet another brick from the wall, the wall of what makes us human. Gender reflects sexual differences, sex differences, not only in genitalia, hormonally and otherwise. When we eliminate gender, we deny these differences. We deny reality. It's a denial mechanism. It's pathological. I'm not misogynistic and I'm not, it's not sexism what I'm saying. This is sick. This is absolutely a sick development. And it is sickening society. It is destroying everything good between men and women. The charm, the miracle, the beauty. Everything had been taken away and replaced by cursing, drinking, casual, disgusting sex with strangers you don't even remember. I mean, it's a horrible scene. It's not a question of debauchery. This is not a moral judgment. It's just that it's ugly. Aesthetically, that's an aesthetic judgment. I mean, compare this to the alternative, the alternative that every young generation for 10,000 years had opted for. Compare it to the alternative of true intimacy, of true love, of a true union and communion of male and female, women and men. Women had been suppressed and enslaved for many millennia. And I'm very happy that they had been liberated and emancipated, but they had taken it a step, not a step, a hundred steps too far. They have ruined the edifice and the the foundation of human society, in effect. Human societies and cultures are constructed on the tension between the female and the male element. Take that away, everything crumbles to dust and can never be ever reconstructed. Take that away and life is no, has no meaning. Take that away and there's no life. We are very close to this tipping point. When I say things in my videos and you attack me or criticize me and so on, which you're entitled to do, why don't you first check the sources? When I say that illiteracy is on the rise, I'm referring to functional illiteracy. Why don't you simply visit Wikipedia? Search for functional illiteracy. You will see what I mean. Same with binge drinking. All the numbers I mentioned, everything I mentioned is based on numbers and studies on research, deep research. I never speak idly. And I'm telling you, we are going to hell in a hen basket. There are no carriers of the torch. These generations between 1991 and today are lost for good and forever. They had been corrupted by their own rejection of life, of gender, of beauty of meaning, of intimacy, of relationships, 
ultimately of love. What is there except love? They have been corrupted by this and they cannot uncorrupt. It's too late for this. Our hope lies in the much younger generations. Those who are born today, those who were born two years ago, four years ago. In the meantime, we, the old folks, gray-haired as we are, we must step into the breach because this is our doing. We did this to them. And by the law of karma, karma caught up with us by doing this to them, by hollowing them out, by rendering them animated characters, avatars, nothings, nothingnesses, by removing every essence and every hope from them, we had actually punished ourselves. By doing this to them, we did this to ourselves. And now we have an obligation to carry on, tired and exhausted as we are. We have an obligation to carry on until those who are four years old today and two years old today are old enough to take the torch from our quavering and trembling hands and carry on the march of humanity. We cannot hand the torch to these generations. We cannot hand the torch to people born after 1990. It would be, that would be treason, a betrayal of everything sacred. We must hold on another 20 years until we are 80, until we are 90, until we die walking, until we die talking, until our corpses litter the earth, and a new generation rises to carry on as human beings, not as empty simulations.